Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Warren. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Agent and the County Extension Coordinator in Camden County. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today is native plants and low maintenance landscapes. And in this presentation, we're going to specifically focus on coastal areas. So we have another talk that focuses on statewide, but um, since the, the coastal environment is a little bit different than the rest of the state, this presentation will focus specifically on the coastal region of Georgia. This presentation is part of the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards Program, and um, it was funded by a Center for Urban Agriculture mini grant. These guidance series will help Georgia residents create certified sustainable Georgia landscapes, protecting our natural resources for future generations. So first we'll talk a little bit about what makes a landscape low maintenance. So there's several things that go into having a lower maintenance landscape. This includes things like using minimal labor, um, not having to spend a lot of your time pulling weeds or applying inputs like fertilizers and herbicides and other treatments. Um, when you establish a, a lower maintenance landscape, it should be pretty self-sufficient and it shouldn't require a lot of regular maintenance and it should, um, should sustain itself well in the natural environment without having to add a lot to it. So this low to no inputs, which includes fertilizers, pesticides, store-bought amendments, and mulch. Another thing um, that goes into this is that the plants thrive easily. They thrive easily in the natural environment, and they need little to no irrigation. So generally, you're putting a lot less time into your landscape because we're focusing on putting the right plant in the right place. So how do we create this low-maintenance landscape? The first and probably most important thing is to plant native plants for your area. Um, native plants are going to be more adapted to the local environment, um, to the local disease and insect pressures, humidity levels, um, rain amounts, you know, average rain amounts, all of those sorts of things the various climate and environmental conditions, they're going to be better adapted to that and have a better um, better success in thriving and surviving than plants that are not native to your area. Another thing is using natural mulch and ground cover. So this can include um, purchased wood chips, but generally a lot of the best mulch that you can find is actually already available in your landscape. Things like leaves, um, you know, different yard debris, we'll go into that in a little bit, um, but some natural ground covers that help hold in moisture and keep weeds blocked out. Establishing strong roots. Um, so we really want all of our plants, no matter what they are, to have a strong root system that will help them better sustain stress from the environment or stressful weather conditions um, and help them to require less. So if we have deep, strong roots, they're gonna be more drought tolerant. They're not gonna need as much water or amendments. Um, another thing that's important is putting the right plant in the right place. This is something as extension agents that we repeat a lot. Um, there, there can be a number of things that go into this, but putting that plant where it wants to be, where it's most happy, making sure that it has adequate space for the size that it will become, not the size it is when you buy it. Um, so spacing it appropriately from buildings and other plants, driveways, roadways, et cetera. Um, making sure that it has the right sun exposure. So if it's something like an understory tree that would naturally grow under other trees and be partially shaded, you don't want to plant it in full sun. Um, vice versa, if it's something that needs full sun, then you don't want to plant it in a shady area. Um, making sure that it's in the correct area of, as far as what its soil moisture and drainage tolerances are. So I see this a lot on the coast where people plant um, plants that really need well-drained soil in order to survive in areas that don't drain well because we have a very high water table on the coast and most of our um, areas don't drain particularly well, even if they have a sandy topsoil, a lot of times water is being held on the roots. Putting in the right place as far as salt tolerance. If you live near the coast, um, near the marsh or a beach, um, or you're getting salt spray off of either a water body or, you know, 
what have you, making sure that it's salt tolerant plants that you have in your landscape. Salt can be very damaging to plants who um, are not adapted to that. And heat tolerance as well. So, you know, we, we have a very hot climate here on the coast. So making sure that the plants that you're putting in your landscape can handle the amount of heat that they're, they're gonna be exposed to. So the first one of those is to plant native. We're gonna go into all those topics a little deeper. So there's a number of reasons to plant native and the more research that's done in this field, the more we're learning how critical it is to utilize native plants in our ecosystem. So native plants help preserve the natural ecosystem. They provide um, habitat to wildlife and pollinators and they provide the best nutrition to those pollinators and wildlife. So we're finding that the plants that our local insects and wildlife evolved with and adapted with provides the best nutrition for them, but also a lot of times um, they've evolved together over time and a lot of our insects and wildlife are only able to feed from very specific plants that they've adapted to their um, defense, those plants defense strategies. So, you know, in order to keep the food web going in our local areas, it's really important that we have native plants um, to support that system. Our native plants are gonna be adapted to our poor coastal soils. They're gonna be adapted to our high heat and high humidity levels. They're gonna be adapted to the coastal storms that we have, um, our mild winters, the sand and salt exposure, and then the soil and drainage issues. They're also gonna be adapted, as I mentioned before, um, to predators, insects, diseased, and the diseases and the pests um, of, of our coastal area. So in Georgia, we have more than 100 distinct environments of plant communities, um, and plants grow where they do because they have finally adjusted to that local environment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, many native pollinators and beneficial insects and wildlife can only feed on or complete their life cycles on native plants that they have evolved with over time. So, you know, maybe insects don't pull on your heartstrings, but if you enjoy having songbirds in your yard or watching songbirds or, you know, basically any type of wildlife or pollinator, they're dependent on native plants and the food webs that those native plants support. So for instance, with songbirds, they're very dependent on um, local native caterpillars. And most of those caterpillars have co-evolved with plant species where they can only feed on um, and complete their life cycle on a specific family of plants um, because they have evolved to disarm the defense strategies of that one specific plant because they couldn't have, they couldn't focus energies on, on um, multiple plant types of defense strategies. So most of them have specialized on one or another. So we'll talk about um, briefly a few different um, native plant species for different types of environments, just some ideas. This is not a comprehensive list by any means, but there'll be some resources at the end for um, more native plant list sources. But just kind of to get you started, so some salt tolerant natives that are herbaceous. So, you know, um, things like you typically would think of as flowers. Um, we have our dune sunflower, um, which has a high salt spray and low soil salinity tolerance. Um, they also are a really nice filler in a, in a landscape bed and do really well. You've got spotted bee balm, which can um, tolerate moderate salt spray. Blanket flower, which has a high salt spray tolerance. You'll actually see that sometimes growing in the dunes and right next to the beach, just like you will with dune sunflower. Coral bean, um, it has a high salt spray tolerance and low soil salinity tolerance. And then also muley grass. Muley grass has a high salt spray tolerance as well. A few more, um, we have seaside goldenrod, which we are finding more and more is a very important um, plant species as far as supporting native ecosystems. Um, so not just seaside goldenrod, but any of your goldenrod species. So it tolerates salt spray and some soil um, salt. 
We've got sand cord grass, um, which will tolerate brackish to fresh water and moderate salt spray. We've got salt marsh cord grass, um, which tolerates salt spray and irregular inundations up to 35 parts per thousand of salinity. Sea oats, which are, um, we've all seen on the beach, I'm sure, and on the dunes. They're salt spray and um, tolerant also of brief inundations of salt water. There's also beach morning glory, which can tolerate high salt spray and soil salinity, and railroad vine, which can tolerate high salt spray and moderate soil salinity. So moving out of our herbaceous plants, moving on to shrubs, um, we've got a number of, of shrubs that have some um, salt tolerance. Saw palmetto, which you've probably seen on the barrier island, so that's kind of a, a no-brainer there. We've got kunti, which you can see in the middle picture there, and I always suggest this as a great replacement for sago palms. Um, kunti and kuntis and sago palms are both cycads. They're an ancient plant, um, not truly a palm, but um, they were around when the dinosaurs were around, and so kunti and sagos are related, but the kuntis are native and they thrive much easier in this environment. Whereas the sagos are actually from China and they have a number of issues in the landscape, but they also don't provide any habitat. The kunti is um, a host plant for a number of species, but some really unique butterfly species. And um, the sagos generally require a lot of maintenance and upkeep. They, um, in their native, homeland of China, they're used to having a good amount of manganese in the soil. So usually here we'll see manganese deficiencies in them, which can cause them to yellow or brown. They also have a lot of problems with scale insects as well here. So um, also I like kuntis because they're not quite as mean as sagos. Um, if you've ever had to stick your arm or try to weed around a sago palm, they're not a very friendly plant. And though the kuntis have very similar structure, they have a blunter tip on the leaflets and um, they're not as rigid and, and spiky. So some other uh, salt tolerant native shrubs, we've got Eastern prickly pear. We've also got beautyberry, which is one of my favorites, um, a great wildlife plant. Those berries are, are great um, food sources for birds and other wildlife. And then also um, their leaves actually have um, some properties where you can use them for um, to make a homemade insect repellent. So, and some people just rub the leaves straight on their skin to, to help repel mosquitoes and other insects. And also Adam's needle. So there's a, a few shrubs to choose from there. And like I said, this list is not extensive. Um, a few others are seashore mallow, which is a, a native hibiscus. Very nice plant, has lots of little pink flowers on it. Um, or maybe I shouldn't say little, small to medium sized pink flowers. It doesn't get as big or as tall um, as a lot of our other native hibiscus species. So it makes um, a nice landscape plant that the pollinators really, really enjoy. Yopon holly, which is great if you're wanting to kind of screen an area as is wax myrtle. Both Yopon holly and wax myrtle have um, berries that also help support wildlife. Swamp rose mallow, which you may have seen, um, especially on the roadsides or natural areas. Um, very pretty native hibiscus, does get pretty tall. Gulf croton and sea oxide daisy. Some of our salt tolerant native trees, um, a lot of these you could see on our, our barrier islands and that's a great indicator of their salt tolerance. So there's coastal cedar, Hercules club, live oaks of course, which are kind of the, the quintessential iconic um, coastal Georgia tree, southern magnolia, and our native palm, the cabbage palm. So now we'll go into some moisture loving natives. Um, this is especially important because as I mentioned before, even if you have sandy topsoil, most landscapes on the coast do not have well-drained soils. We get a lot of rainfall and a very humid climate, of course. Um, 
but a lot of rainfall and a lot of times there are heavy storms. So our soils get really inundated and saturated very quickly. Um, so a lot of times there is moisture being held on the roots of plants, even if you're not seeing it on the surface. In fact, the number one landscape issue that I see in coastal Georgia um, is over water. You know, whether it's that someone is overwatering or just naturally there's too much water for what the plants that they're trying to grow that aren't adjusted to it. So I'm always recommending to clients um, some moisture loving natives to incorporate into their landscape that can better tolerate those conditions um, without failure or disease issues. So a few of these, um, you've got things like Adamasco lily, you've got blue eyed grass, cardinal flower, which is very popular with um, the hummingbirds among other things, swamp sunflower, yellow canna, southern blue flag iris, ironweed, which you can see in the upper right there and is another very popular pollinator plant. Um, our native hibiscuses are all pretty moisture tolerant. Cinnamon fern, royal fern, Virginia chain fern, river oats, and bushy blue stem, which is a bunch grass. Some of our moisture loving um, native shrubs, we've got bottle brush buckeye, button bush, which has a really unique flower that looks kind of like fireworks, um, dayhoon holly, elderberry, summer sweet, swamp azalea, sweet spire or Virginia sweet spire, sweet shrub, tai tai, and viburnum. So some of our moisture loving trees, you may see a lot of these um, in the roadsides through, through parts of the coast where it's a little lower. Um, and in some of the wetland areas. So bald cypress, buckwheat tree, loblolly bay, red maples, which are one of my favorite, sweet bay magnolias, water tupelo, and silver bells would all be good choices for um, tree places that you'd like to place trees in your landscape that need a little more moisture tolerance. So some of our shade tolerant um, plants, you know, not, not everywhere that we have here on the coast is full of sunshine. So if you've got some shady areas in your landscape, you can incorporate some great natives into there as well. So um, we've got Adamasco lily, azure sage, the bee balms, so scarlet bee balm, this could also be true, um, probably a little bit for um, the spotted bee balm as well, frostweed, Green Dragon, and <clears throat> excuse me, Indian Pink, Lobelia, Red Columbine, Snake Root, and Wing Stem. So some shade tolerant native shrubs. Again, we have Beautyberry. Um, it's kind of it, it will survive in most any environment you put it in, it'll survive. It, it'll be moisture tolerant, shade tolerant, full sun tolerant. Um, it's really a, a nice tough plant that offers a lot to the landscape. American olive, bottle brush buckeye, devil's walking stick, native azaleas, oak leaf hydrangea, red anise, sparkleberry, stagger bush, witch hazel, and yopon holly. So these are, are a lot of plants that you will see growing naturally in the understory in wooded areas. So some shade tolerant native trees that we have, these are gonna be trees that you typically find again in the understory in wooded areas. So they're used to having some shade. They're not gonna do usually quite as well in full sun areas. American holly, American hornbeam, American silver bells, black gum, buckwheat tree, cabbage palm, dayhoon holly, eastern redbud, which is one of my favorites, red buckeye, pawpaw, which also has a nice edible fruit, possum haw, and sweet bay magnolia.
So at the end here, we've thrown in just kind of some tough and resilient natives that'll tolerate a lot of, you know, poor soils or kind of crummy environments and, and kind of thrive in whatever you put them in on the coast. So one of my favorites is at the top there, Passion Vine, which you can see on the far right. It has a super funky flower. It's the host plant for the Gulf fritillary butterfly. It has an edible fruit um, for humans or wildlife. So it's a, it's a plant that packs a lot a punch. Um, it's got, got a lot of uses there. Passion Vine, Butterfly Pea, New Jersey Tea, Sandhills Milkweed, Georgia basil, tick seed, which you may grow, see growing in some kind of poor um, roadside areas, the kunti, and dwarf palm. All right, so going into some of our other topics now that we've talked about some native plants, natural mulch and ground cover. So leaves and natural fallen debris provide free mulch. Um, this is also kind of the best mulch that you can use. Sometimes the best things are the simplest. So those that leaves and natural debris retain soil moisture. It helps feed soil and improves the soil structure as it decomposes. It offers naturally appropriate nutrition to native plants. Um, an, our, a retired arborist that I used to work with, he's, he used to always say that the best fertilizer that you could give a tree was its own leaves. Um, and the best fertilizer you could give a lawn was its own clippings because it has the exact right nutrient ratio um, that decomposing matter does that the plant needs. It also um, reduces erosion and the crusting of soils from Im impact of bare soils from water droplets. And one thing also that's really important is it offers habitat to pollinators and beneficial insects. So a lot of times we don't think about this, but it's really important to leave some leaves in our landscape. If you're not comfortable leaving them as they fall, you can rake them into mulch beds or you can even rake them into a pile and leave them, you know, or one area of the yard and leave them. Um, but there are a number of species of insects, lizards, frogs, um, slug eating garden snakes, you know, different, different species that need those fallen leaves either to overwinter in um, for safety and warmth or to complete their life cycle. So um, leaving some leaves in your landscape is very important. Establishing strong roots. Um, it's more important to water deeply and frequently and infrequently once the plant is established. Um, so, you know, only water if you haven't had any rain in seven to 10 days. And you definitely don't want to put down any more than an inch a week, including rainfall. Most of these plants, especially if you're planting native, though, once you get your plants established, they shouldn't need watering at all um, or fertilization at all, usually, if, they're putting, if you're planting the right plant in the right place. So watch for signs of drought stress and utilize that as a sign to water. So this may be things like, you know, the leaves starting to wilt a little bit or curl a little bit. So be careful because sometimes overwatering can cause a similar, um, similar symptoms. So, you know, one great way to test too is sticking your finger in the soil and seeing if it's dry or wet, if you're seeing those signs. Also planting correctly. Um, this depends on the different plant that you're planting, but there's lots of information out there. You can also reach out to your local county agent on information about planting correctly. Um, it depends on if you're planting a tree or a flower or a shrub as far as what that all entails. But, um, you know, taking the time to make sure you're putting things in correctly when you plant them will go a long way in the long-term health um, of that plant. So again, putting the right plant in the right place. So it's really important to think about the size a plant will become, not the size it is when you buy it. So you may buy, um, you know, a plant that's in a in a six pack, but it will it'll get three feet wide eventually. Um, I see this a lot with trees, especially live oaks. You know, if you're thinking about putting a live oak in your landscape on the coast, think about how large those are in downtown St. Mary's or in downtown Savannah. That's how much space you need to, uh, to allot for that tree. Um, 
you know, any species that you're thinking about planting, you can always do a quick Google search to see what size it will become. You can also, as I mentioned, reach out to your local county extension agent for help. Generally, it's a good idea to plant in odd numbers and in groups of three or more. Um, some of this is for aesthetics, but also those plants, um, the individuals work together and help support each other. Follow the label for the sun and moisture requirements. So most plants that you buy are going to have a label on them that tell you how much sun it likes. Um, a lot of times it'll tell you how much moisture it likes, whether it likes dry soils or wet soils or moist soils. Moist soils. Um, make sure you're planting those plants in the appropriate zone. So they should also have a zone on the tag that tells you, you know, what USDA climate zone they're appropriate for. And make sure um, that you're, you're planting plants that that will be happy in the zone that you live in. So we've got a few resources listed here if you wanna learn more information. Coastal Wildscapes has some um, vendor lists for native plant vendors. They also have two plant sales per year um, and some educational resources as well. There's a great book resource that um, I have printed copies of that I utilize a lot in my office for clients but um, it's called Fire Adaptive Landscaping, but it has a lot of lists in it for different um, environments on the coast and the native plants that do well there. Um, and through this link, you can reach the PDF of it and see the entire book online. There's also a great resource through Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. They have a native plant search engine, so you can search um, for native plants for your landscape. Um, by the exact requirements of your site. So you could put in the amount of sunlight, the amount of water, um, you know, the drainage, different issues like that, and get a list of different plants that would be suitable for your area that are native. So as far as our certification metric for the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards Program, the checklist items from this presentation that you will find on the metric are plant native plants adapted to your climate and natural pest, put the right plant in the right place, consider sun, soil moisture, salt tolerance, spacing and temperature, plant in groups of three, use natural mulch and ground cover, leaves, pine straw and woody debris, establish strong roots, plant correctly, use native plants and water deeply and infrequently. If you have any questions specific to the Georgia Green Landscape Stewards Program, um, feel free to reach out to us at georgiagreen at uga.edu. You can also visit our website for more information on the program. And if you have specific questions about your landscape, please reach out to your local extension agent. There is someone serving every county in Georgia, and we're glad to help you. I'd also like to, to give a special thanks to Eamon Leonard of Georgia DNR Non-Game for sharing some pictures and verbiage um, and special thanks to Coastal Wildscapes for some of their plant lists and resources for this presentation.